Um, <clears throat> so um, I am uh, sort of new to this uh, seminar. I'm, I'm an operator of this. I do the classification of CETA objects by K theory. So this is sort of a side uh, interest for me. Um, I have a very good reason for wanting to know these things. Um, and I will start by explaining that. Uh, but it's also going to be fairly clear that I'm really not an expert on, on these kinds of things. So if you have any ideas or if there's some literature you think I may have missed, please, please tell me. Uh, so there might be, you know, it's uh, it, it's quite likely that there's something that uh, I need to know that I just haven't uh, um, found. So um, <clears throat> let me start by the, the, the motivation that this, this is really a very personal uh, motivation, and this has to do with the mathematics of Lego, which is something that I've been working a lot on, mainly as an outreach uh, project. So um, this is something that started for me in 2002, I think it was, but uh, uh, a couple of years later, um, I found in the Lego company profile this uh, factoid that uh, there are 102, 981,500 different ways of combining six, eight star bricks of the same color. And uh, for various reasons, I got a little bit suspicious about this number and I actually figured out that it was wrong. So uh, this number that you see there, this is roughly uh, 46 to the fifth divided by two. And this is the number of towers that you can make with six Lego bricks. So if you have and it's a two by four, so there's 46 ways of putting one on top of the other. And if you have six of them and you want to build sort of a six story high thing, then you have 46 choices five times. And then there's symmetry, so you divide by two, roughly. So uh, the right number is this one here, 915,103,765. And uh, I computed this for the first time. I wrote a computer program, a very inefficient one. It took me actually uh, almost a week. Uh, then I was very lucky that there was a uh, talented um, uh, high school student uh, called uh, Ming Abrahams who uh, wanted to do a project with me and I asked him to do the computation independently and after he got the same number, I feel fairly convinced that he was correct. Uh, so let me just show you, this is something that you can find uh, many places and in many languages. So since I'm also speaking in Jerusalem, I chose uh, this one. I have no idea what it says, but uh, <laughs> but down here there's a picture of a wall at um, at uh, the Lego house, and the Lego house is like a, a place where you can. It's like a, a science park type of uh, building, uh, and here they uh, have uh, my name spelled wrong. Uh, to say that I can give you this number for the first time. And actually the way it works is that when you leave the Lego house, you get issued your own combination. So they, they give you a little plastic card and they say, this is your combination. And then people ask them, they told me, what when you run, what, what are you going to do when you run out of um, options? And then they say, well, we have another 400 years at least. So, uh, mm -hmm. so this is somehow how they do things. So <clears throat> this is nine, nine bricks. They, I mean, they, this is just six. Yeah. You just go with seven, right? So, um, so, 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 and the, 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 this is the formula for the towers. Like this, uh, forty-six to the n minus one plus two to the n minus one. This is symmetry. These are. This is the number of symmetric building, and then divide by five to the two. So anyway, uh, this is something that I, I, you know, I got interested in at some point, and uh, now where is my screen? Actually, then I worked with. Uh, Maybe, maybe just recently became uh, an associate uh, professor at the computer science department here. Um, so we made uh, more efficient programs and we made counts. So uh, as far as I know, the record, this is in OEIS, but that's just because I put it there. Um, so <laughs> this is the number of uh, buildings that you have with between one and 12 bricks if, if it's a one by two. And if it's a two by four, which is sort of the traditional one, then our number is here, and, uh, and we computed it up to eight. That took me something like 500 CPU hours. And then actually somebody uh, has uh, broken the record twice. Uh, Johan Nilsson did nine, and uh, uh, a guy called Simon uh, did 10. So uh, this, these are, these are, I mean, this is something he did in parallel, something like 200 computers at the 
uh, University of Bielefeld math department. So when people left, he sort of wrote a virus, it did some patient. So he could do this in a month or something like that. Uh, Mr. Simon, uh, he did it in 22 months uh, on one computer or one and a half. But he brought it his daughters, he told me, but then it sort of broke down and then he was not allowed to borrow that thing. So anyway, so this is sort of the state of our accounting, but this is not really what I want to talk about. I want to talk about coloring, which is uh, something that I decided maybe uh, because this counting is really very hard, you know, writing the uh, efficient programs, uh, measuring the rate of growth and so on. This is an interesting mathematical problem. But at some point I, I started uh, to think about color. And so the history of Lego and color is somewhat interesting. So in the beginning, uh, you would actually have sort of a, almost a continuum of colors because they would sort of make you know, every batch would have different colors. So uh, these are all people collect these things as you can imagine. But, but then the whole idea, which is at the base of the success of Lego is the system idea when you sort of make things very systematic and make sure that you can reuse any part as many times as possible and so on. So they also made uh, uh, strong, precise conventions about colors and they chose these Colors, the internet tells me they were probably uh, inspired by Montreal with the paper. Uh, but actually, so I'm going to use these colors in my in my um, visualizations. And I'm going to use them like one, two, three, four, five. And I'm going to use need one more. And I'm choosing green right? because green is actually also quite common in, in the book. But but these are probably the four, the five original colors, black or white. So uh, at some point, maybe around 2008, I asked myself the question, <clears throat> if you have a building with Lego bricks, but you only use the same type of Lego, like a two by four, and then you ask the question, how many colors would you have to use so that two neighboring bricks have different colors? Um, and what I mean by neighboring, of course, needs to be defined carefully. So what I mean by neighboring is that they touch over sort of a positive area. So they might sort of one is attached to the other, or they could be next to each other, then they have to have a, a positive area uh, in common. So if they just meet at a corner, or if they just meet at a line, that doesn't count. So of course, that's a convention. You could change that, then you would have a slightly different uh, problem. So this is the convention that I'm using. And since I'm using this convention, uh, it's very easy to see that uh, you can always get by with eight colors, right? Because you can you can think of your buildings as being in layers. So you have your Lego bricks that go one high. So when you have one building of uh, one layer of Lego bricks, then the four colors here will tell you the four colors twice. Then you go to the next level and then you take four other colors. But now the point is that you can use the four colors that you did down, down here, you can use them here again. So obviously eight colors is enough for these kinds of of legal uh, coloring problems. Uh, nevertheless, even though I've been thinking about this off and on for 14 years, I only I can only tell you the exact number for three sizes. These are all things that you can buy from Lego, the one by one, the one by two, and the two by two. The one by one is trivial, of course, because you can do sort of checkered uh, 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 chessboard uh, coloring. So two colors suffice. So this is sort of the question that I have in mind. And I've been talking to a lot of people over the years uh, about this. Some of these names you may recognize because these are sort of established mathematicians. Some of them you may not know. These, these are uh, students uh, that I encountered at various uh, points. Uh, I have a course called uh, Experimental Mathematics that I teach sort of roughly every second year. And this is a project that you could choose. And some people chose it and, and actually made some progress. So, I will be very specific about the input that I have from the students, whereas the senior people I'll be less uh, careful about. Uh, I will also say that uh, I'm currently working with Atmos, who's sitting over there. Uh, we're going to write a paper about something uh, of this. Uh, but you know, I think if I ever try to write this down in one big paper, it's going to be very tricky for me to make a list of authors because you know I've been talking to too many people about this. So uh, I'll, I'll not dwell so much on this, but uh, if you have any questions uh, or any complaints, uh, let me know. Okay, <clears throat> so I want to maybe start out by by abstracting the question a little bit. 
and say something about what I mean by uh, um, a, a cuboid representation of a graph. So uh, I have a graph down here. You can see it's a planar graph. It has seven uh, vertices. And I'm claiming that this can be represented by boxes or cuboids in the way that you see on top. And so the point is that so this is not supposed to be an efficient coloring, right? I mean, I'm using seven colors so that we can, we can recognize the objects. But you sort of have here, there's a there's a big triangle, which is the, the layer over here where I have these three colors here. And then on the back side, there's four that somehow touch in this way here. And so the, the point that I'm trying to, to make here is that uh, whenever I have uh, a configuration of uh, objects like this, then I can say if two of them touch, I will draw a line between the corresponding vertices. <coughs> and so uh, I could do this a little bit more formally, and maybe we should just spend one minute on it, even though I guess the drawing is actually maybe easier to understand. Uh, but, but there is a concept of a contact graph, which is a standard concept, so let me just use it here. That you something you can do if you have any sort of uh, collection of subsets of R3, let's say uh, M, and then uh, M should be the same as M, right? So I have uh, M objects, and I assume that the interiors uh, are disjoint. And then I will make a, uh, uh, I will draw a graph so that whenever I have uh, a set, I will take a vertex and call it one, two, three, and so on. And I will make an edge between two, uh, ver two vertices if the corresponding sets intersect non trivial. So, for this to work with what we just did, what essentially what we have to do is we have to take the, the box or the cuboid and we have to remove everything that lives around the sort of uh, uh, grid around the sides, right? Because I, if I have, for instance, you know, if, if two cuboids just intersect in a line, that doesn't count. And the way you, you would do this is you just remove the, the, the corresponding uh, subset from the objects. So this is going to be a, a set which is neither closed or, uh, or open, where you just remove um, you know, this, this sort of grid. And the easier way, which takes less space, is to just remove all the points on, on the grids, right? So if you have a point with three coordinates and two of them are integral, then you remove this. So that's really like cutting all these uh, sides of them. And then th that will work in the sense that if, if I just, this is how my cuboids are made and I, and, and I then draw like this, then the point is that even though, for instance, you, you can have some objects that just cross along a line, like the black and the white one, they don't really intersect properly. Uh, sorry, the black and the red, what I meant, right? So there's no line between the black and the red because I don't assume, I, I don't consider them to intersect, right? And that's because I've removed these lines. But I mean, in practice, I think you all you know, guess what I mean. So I'm not really going to remove this uh, this uh, wire network. Uh, so <clears throat> if you sort of do the opposite, I mean, so uh, this far, you know, I can talk about the situation here, the graph. Uh, here, here's a bunch of cuboids and here's the graph, but you can sort of do the opposite question. Right? You start with the graph and then you ask, can you find some cuboids that will give this graph? And there's a, a, a significant literature about this. Um, so we will say that if we have a graph, if, it's, if it can be uh, represented with a bunch of cuboids uh, intersecting in the appropriate way, we call this a box representation. And if we can do it in one layer, so that's just saying that you know the the, the, the set coordinates is uh, one high and everything lives in part in sort of one layer, then we call the box representation planar. And uh, one important result, which is very well known, is, is due to Carl Tarski. So he proved that any planar graph has a box representation. And he also proved that uh, a planar graph has a planar box representation precisely when all triangles are different. And you can sort of see in, in the drawing here what, what this is all about. If you were, this is a planar graph, and you can see that I've done a cuboid representation of it. So this is consistent with the theorem. But there's no way we can do this in one plane. 
because if you think of this triangle outside, it has to be made by something like this, right? Because if you have a planar triangle built by cuboids, it has to be a point in the middle. So then there's not room to put anything inside the triangle. So this is what, what Carsten is pointing out, and this actually turns out to be the only problem. So if you have a planar graph with no triangles like this, then you can always find a planar uh, box. So I'm sort of mentioning this because it's a, a background for, for what I tried to do, but I'm really interested in coloring uh, and chromatic numbers. And so if things are planar, this is not very interesting. So really the, the things that I'm thinking about will be uh, honestly pretty deep. Uh, but I'm mentioning this because I mean, there is you know, results that you can uh, look at. It's obvious that if you try to uh, represent uh, complete graph, you can only do this if uh, there's four or fewer vertices, for more or less the same reason as before. So if you have, if you want, if you want to have four boxes that all touch each other, you do two of them this way and two of them this way, and then they overlap. I'll show you examples later. Uh, but if you have five, it's impossible because essentially at the middle of the four of them, there has to be a point, and this point cannot be touched by anything else because it's sort of wrapped inside the, the four. Uh, original ones. But you can do bipartite graphs as big as you like. So if you have like uh, K and M, right? So what you do is you just take some very long cuboids and you put like M of them this way, and then you put M of them this way in the next step. So, so I mean, I don't think there is a theory about how to recognize which, uh, um, which, if, which, can, which concrete graphs can be given cuboid representations if they're not planar. Um, but there is a, a big literature, for instance, it's known, and this is something that's been done fairly recently, that all uh, planar graphs can be represented with cubes of various sizes. This is a fairly hard problem. Minor closed terminals? Sorry? Minor closed terminals? Uh, what? Minor closed. I would expect. So, but I, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, let me now move on to coloring. So um, there is a theorem by uh, Reed and Allwright, which says that if you look at completely general uh, graphs which have box representations, then there's no upper bound for the chromatic number. This is actually something that came up in uh, what's called a study group with industry somewhere in Denmark um, many years ago. There was a company that had somehow invented some sort of paint, as far as I understand, that would help uh, protect uh, Wi Fi signals from one room to be uh, readable from another room. But the point is that they could only make it work over two walls. So they somehow, their idea was that they could somehow say that in any office configuration, uh, there are no more than, you can color all the offices with 10 colors or something like that. They could say to the customers, you need 10 different Wi-Fi channels or something like that. That, that was the end. So they asked people to think about this and, uh, and then it was found that actually it's impossible. So you can make these really uh, complicated um, configurations that will have an unbounded form. And they're all made by people. So this is from the paper. Uh, more recently, there's a construction that's based on uh, Descartes graphs. So this is uh, uh, so Descartes. You probably uh, know this. So Descartes is, uh, is a pseudonym for some um, Cambridge uh, young Cambridge mathematicians, including Tully, um, and they um, they found a, a class of graphs that have interesting properties and you can represent them with cuboids in a special way and this is another. So uh, I haven't really explained what I mean by chi of star class r is infinity, but what I mean is that suppose that we have completely arbitrary cuboids, um, then the chromatic number, there's no sort of soup of the chromatic numbers. So when I pass on to the next slide, maybe this will be more clear. So suppose that we fix the last coordinate to be one. So the set coordinates is one. So this means that now the, the buildings have three layers, just like we discussed before. So just like with Lego, but the, the first and the second coordinate can be completely 
group. So essentially, you choose a bunch of rectangles as as complicated as you like, and then you sort of put them in layers. So we've seen that eight colors is enough, uh, but actually uh, proving that eight colors is also necessary is somewhat complicated. This was done by Bessie and others A, uh, and they have a, a fairly concrete construction. They have something they call the gadget, and then they sort of take this gadget and they they stretch it and and, and, and contort it in a way so we sort of stretch it in different ways in different parts in sort of a, a pattern when you prove that this cannot be colored with set. That's essentially how it works. But so the 330 blocks, they claim this is the smallest one. No, I don't think it helps if you have more than two layers, but that's what they have. They have only two layers. So, so you can sort of ask the question if you have something that was higher, but still <laughs> later you could get to eight in a quicker way. Uh, this is open as far as I know. But my point here is that really just like over here, there's no way you can choose these uh, cuboids in the in the in the examples to be all of the same size. So this is somehow uh, what comes out of these constructions. And this there's no literature about this one, but that's easy. So if you just fix, uh, if you just let the x and z coordinate be one, and let the first, I'm oh, sorry, y and z be one, and the first one be three. Then any so you should sort of think of, of uh, these look like like uh, you know strips or like uh, I I you know I think of uh, French flags when I when I think of these kinds of configurations. Uh, I'll go to, to show you a proof that four colors are enough, and uh, something like this shows you that four colors is necessary. Right? Because if you had only three colors, you could you would use one in the middle, and then you would have to use the other two. Uh, uh, ultimately, but since there's an odd cycle here, this is, this is one of the easy ways of putting it. So uh, let me just show you uh, how you can argue. Uh, um, so I'm just showing you something of this nature, right? So this is this is supposed to be some random object with uh, a by one by one. Um, uh, cuboids, and the point really is that you can sort of look at it from the end. And when you look at it from the end, you get a uh, a chessboard, right? So you can sort of say this I will color black and white, black and white, and so on. So you can sort of say that looking from the end, you will use uh, you will use one coloring or the other coloring uh, ultimately. But then the point is that now these uh, different uh, Lines, they don't meet each other. So essentially, now it's a one dimensional coloring problem. And then, of course, two colors would be enough because you just alternate colors. So, uh, the reason why four is enough is that, you know, whenever you have uh, one, of these, uh, one of these long sticks, you just use two colors alternately. So, you can use like one and two and one and two on the odd ones and three and four and three and four on the even ones. So, this is why four colors will suffice. So um, <clears throat> this is somehow the status of that. So, so what I just explained in what I call general knowledge, this is something that really hasn't got so much to do with Lego because in Lego, we somehow have to fix the size. And so what I want to do now is to do look at something which is slightly more general than Lego coloring, uh, but uh, a lot less general than what I already showed you. So uh, from now on, I only care about the case where all the cuboids in a configuration are mutually congruent. So what I mean by this is that I will take some size and then, uh, so that I will call A, B, C, and then I will only look at cuboids that have the form uh, length A in the X direction, length B in the Y direction of the device here, and then length C in the Z direction. And I'm going to uh, ask that all my cuboids have their corners at uh, integer uh, points. This uh, is not usually uh, a restriction that you make. So for instance, in Thomas's uh, theorem, this is not really mentioned, but you can always arrange this because if you only have finitely many, you can sort of say, you know, the coordinates can be rational. And then you can just with, with you know, a bound of the, of the denominator of all the 
fractions, and then you just multiply, you just multiply by that number, so you can just rescale, and it's not really a restriction to ask that they end up in these endpoints. So what I have in mind is that I only look at configurations where all the where all the uh, cuboids have the same form, but I'm very willing to change that form. Right. So I want to look at uh, the general setup with the same um, with the same cuboid. And now I'm going to ask. I'm sort of going to look at three different kinds of classes. So what I'm calling ruling cuboid one. This is just all the cuboids that you get by taking one size and then you translate these around. So these are just the integer translator of one fixed cuboid in some fixed um, position. But then what I call CC2, I'm allowing myself to make rotations in the XY plane. This is really the Lego type of problem. If you think of what is a Lego brick, right? There's a, there's a big difference between the set coordinate because that's where you do the clicking and the other coordinates. So, so you can sort of turn in the X, Y uh, um, direction, but you cannot, you cannot sort of interchange X and Y. So this is uh, sort of X and Z. So, okay. so really what I do is I just take CC1 of A, B, C, and then CC1 of B, of C. And then CC3, I just do all the six different uh, orientations, and it's a bit shorter to write it with CC2. That's the point is that I have C's at the end, B's at the end, and A's. So I'm really thinking about three different kinds of problems, and the two first kind of problems are easy to do with Lego, because at least you know B is fixed to one. Because in the first one you don't turn your bricks, in the second one you turn them in the uh, X Y plane, but in the last one you can't really do this with Lego because that would sort of allow you to take a, a one by four and put it in ups, uh, uh, let it be sort of be uh, vertical, and that doesn't really. Matter. And then uh, I'll just use chi dot ABC. That's the maximum chromatic number for a graph that has a box representation with cuboids taken from these sets. And, and here, as far as I can see, there's, there's very little uh, literature. Uh, people have worked on representing planar graphs with, um, with cuboids that have the same volume. This is the closest I can get. Uh, so it, it doesn't look like something that people have have studied very much. Um, if you do it in a planar way, it's fairly easy to see that there's a difference. Because for instance, if you have like a, um, a quadrilateral, right? So that I did mean a cycle of length four. So inside a cycle of length four, four it's very easy to put a triangle if your cuboids are of different size. But if they have the same size, then this outer triangle will make it, they will have a certain size. So you cannot fit a triangle inside. So you can sort of you can easily find graphs that you can represent in a, with a planar box graph uh, if you allow general cuboids, but not with uh, mutually congruent cuboids. But in general, I don't really know. so I don't really have a lot to say about this general problem. But this is what I can say about chromatic numbers, and this is sort of the takeaway from, from the talk. So this is what. Uh, I'm going to explain. So uh, I'm going to look at the smallest non-trivial uh, cuboid. That's the two one one, and there are three chromatic numbers. One where you don't allow to 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 move it at all, so you can just sort of copy copy it around, or you can turn it in the x y um, uh, direction, or you can turn it in any direction. That gives you three different chromatic numbers, and of course, this is smaller. Then the max, if you let this vary, if you let the first, the two first, the three first coordinates vary. And so these numbers are, of course, less than or equal to the numbers that I call chi star by one, chi star by one, chi star by star, right? Because this is just, uh, that's where they can have different sizes, but the dimensions will have to be restricted in size, as I said. So whenever you see a less than or equal in these, uh, Six relations, a less than or equal is defeat. Right? This is me uh, stating something completely tautological, and that's because that's the best I know. I, I cannot tell you if these numbers are different. This is what it means when you see less than equal. You see that here, and here this is this is somehow annoying problems that I have. I'm not going to explain. So in other cases, 
I can at least say something that these are different. And in this case, uh, this, so this is somehow, uh, this this is a sample of the kind of uh, things that I've been working on. I think these are the most interesting. So <clears throat> actually there's there's a little uh, point here because I said, I said over here, I said, I said max of the high free of ABC. And it's not completely obvious that there is a max. I just clear that you know if I have pi two a b one, then I use the four color theorem. And I'm actually let me ask this as a question. It's been unclear to me if I really need the four color theorem because the, the, the graphs that I get are nice, all the triangles are empty. I don't know if it's easier to prove the four color theorem in that situation, but anyway, that's that one I, I just need that four color theorem. But anyway, uh, this one it's not completely clear that this is a finite number, but but that actually turns out to be the case. And uh, this was explained to me by a student. This was another very, he has finished his, his master's degree here uh, some years ago, but uh, I corresponded with him when he was in high school and I asked him to think about this. And he came back and told me that sure, this is a bound number and this argument with this. So if you fix your box size and you don't allow to draw, uh, to, to, to rotate, then the number of neighbors that any box can have is bounded by 40. And I'll use this box here to explain, right? So if you just have this kind of box and you sort of say, okay, how many can I put next to? If you want to fill up this side, you can put four. And then you can also put four here. But now you fill up uh, these planes, so you can only put two here and then one. Here. So if you sum all that up, that's 40. That's the number, it's the same as the number of neighbors a cube can have. So since I'm not allowing to turn it, uh, 14 is uh, uh, the maximal valency of a box representation that we could fix cuboid like this. So this means that this number chi one is bounded by 15. Uh, and then so chi three, you can bound this by six times chi one because I have this cuboid I can move it in six different directions. So if I just take the ones where the cuboid turns this way and I color it with 15 colors, and then I take the, all the colors, all the configurations where the cuboid turns this way and I color it with 15 other colors, then that's a color. Right? So this is not going to go to infinity. There's a finite number. And my first bound is 150. I could do better, but still not very good. So we'll, we'll come to so, so this is the first sort of three plus. This is infinity by a region all right. This is fine. So, and the point here, right, is that I'm I'm allowing A, B, and C to bear, right? Because it's clear that if you fix A, B, and C, there's a, there's a, an obvious upper bound to the number of neighbors any any people can have. So, of course, the number is is, is finite. But the the open uh, the, the more advanced question is suppose that you look at any box. And then compute the uh, chromatic numbers for all the cuboid configurations with this box in all dimensions. And you cannot use the four color theorem because you know this extends to more than one layer. Then uh, you have to argue, I just did this, that it's a higher. Okay. Okay. Uh, so um, now let me tell you uh, something about chi one. So chi one is a situation where I don't turn things around. And I want to make the first observation that uh, chi one of two, one, one is three. So this is one of the numbers that I had in my takeaway. And also that chi one of n, one, one, with n uh, bigger than equal to four is four. And the arguments for this are fairly uh, straightforward. Actually, I already gave you the graph that showed you that you need four colors with uh, four by one or uh, five by one or longer. And this uh, this is the configuration and this is the corresponding graph. It's easy to see that you cannot recolor that. And the argument would be something like this. So if you sort of look at the back, if you had only three colors, let's say we don't have the white one, right? So the, the, the back side would have to be, I guess I can point it here. If I had only three colors, I would have to do this. Right? I would have to repeat this color here. And now that the graph is made so that in the outer triangle, everything sees something red. So right here, here, here. So I cannot use the red one. And then if I only have two colors left and it's an odd uh, cycle, like three, then I cannot recolor. 
So four is the number of colors that I need. And, and since it's planar, of course, four, uh, four is enough. And you can see that this problem is, uh, is uh, it works. You can also see that if you just have the dimer, the one that's two by one by one, then uh, three colors are enough. And what you do is you do sort of a, something that looks a bit like the, the, the checkered drawing that I, what, that I mentioned for the one by one by one, but it's somewhat more complicated. I do a six by two by two uh, region and I color it according to this color region. Right? So this means that if I, if I take my two by one by one uh, cuboid and I place it somewhere, then I will take the color that I get in the leftmost um, little box there. And it's easy to check that if I do this, I will not get any, uh, I will not get any uh, touching cuboids that have the same color. So this is why three colors are enough. So this of course tells me, so that's my first takeaway. So this number here is three, this max here is four, and that's the same as what I have over here. So, um, so this is all that I want to know, except there's one thing that I didn't tell you, and that is what happens when you have a three by one by one. Because actually, if you look at this con concrete uh, configuration, you can see that you can actually not build it with three by one, because you need it to be long enough so that you get, uh, I mean, you have to put things a little bit uh, next to each other so that you have exactly this overlap. And you need not do this with a three by one by one, but you can do it with a four by one by one as I'm showing you, and you can very easily make it longer and just extend uh, in the direction that that's the, the negative speed that you want. So uh, I owe you the explanation of what happens with three, and I'm going to give you that explanation in a second. So now I would like to say a little bit about uh, experimental mathematics and the way that we can use in this uh, question as a test case in, in my course. So this is something, you know, <coughs> I have this course, there's a book, you will read some things, you learn some methods, and then there's really lots of, of projects that people do. And uh, there are many, the last many years, I've had like a catalog, and then people look in this catalog and they say, okay, I would like to do this. So some people have chosen to work on Lego coloring. And, uh, and a lot of what I'm going to show you now comes from these uh, people. So these are students who uh, took my course and came up with some ideas that somehow uh, were very useful and I've been uh, working on them and uh, refining them over the years. So I'm, I'll be very specific about where these ideas come from. So this, this goes back a long time, 10 years. So I had these three uh, students and uh, they came up with this recipe for finding uh, configurations that needed many colors. And so the idea that they came up with uh, was to think of it as a game. So you sort of have a game with two players. Player one wants to obtain a chromatic number. That's a target, four, five, six. And player two wants to make sure that player one does not do this. So the way it works is that player one will keep adding bricks to force a new color to be used, right? So if you sort of have you sort of play for a while and you have a bunch of colors and three colors, then if player one can find a place to put a new brick that touches all the three colors, then this is a candidate for forcing the chromatic number up to four. Player two will just use the built-in uh, uh, algorithm for finding chromatic numbers and finding efficient uh, coloring of, of graphs built into maple to recolor, right? So it's not necessarily the case that just because you put something at some point, which with this given coloring needs a new color, that doesn't mean that you have to use it. Maybe there's another way of coloring the whole structure, which is more economic. And the way that these guys did it in the beginning was that they were player one. So there was a human being that uh, came up with something and then they gave it to the computer, the computer would recolor and then they put something uh, into sort of uh, destroy the computer's um, coloring. And they did this uh, for long enough that they came up with this, which was news to me at the time, that there's a way of getting to four colors with a two by two by one. I'll show you in a second. And they found some other things that were not available uh, to me at the time. 
But actually, you know, thinking more about what they did was uh, I, I then wrote a program where the computer plays both sides. I think this is really the way you should do this, right? So you have one player that sort of tries to, uh, that's, that's, that's a computer program that tries to uh, get the chromatic number up. And then the other player is uh, another computer program that tries to keep it down. And then you just let it play for a long time uh, against itself. And then you sort of say, well, in the cases where player one did well, something interesting might happen. So this is essentially how, how this works. So I, I, let me show you a little bit of, about how, how this program works. So uh, first of all, let me just show you. This is a, so this is actually output from a program like this. This is, a, this is the proof that you need five colors with a two by two by one, right? So this is really a Lego situation with two by two. And uh, this is something that my computer program found. And I think, you know, there's something quite beautiful about this because it's really very easy, and I'm going to give you the proof, it's very easy to prove that, that you cannot get by with four colors. But this is really something that's an output of a, of a, a computer program. However, I should say that if you do this computer program for something like getting to five with two by two by one, this is not super hard. So if you run a program, then usually with, with my maple program, this will maybe take five minutes, uh, and then you'll get a hit. And then maybe you can do this many times. And then you'll, of course, you will keep the smallest uh, counter examples. So this is, this is the smallest one that I know. And it's actually a little bit smaller than the one that these guys find. So why do you need five colors? Well, there's a very beautiful argument. If you sort of look here at the top, you see these uh, four, uh, four bricks, they all touch each other. That's a K4. So if I only have four colors, I have to use one each. So if I still only have one color, this means that this one, which is next to the red and blue and white, has to be yellow. And this one here, which is next to the blue and red, blue, and yellow, and white, it has to be red. And then in the next layer, which has, uh, which has four like this, you can, in the same way, you can prove this has to be red, this has to be white, this has to be blue, this has to be red, just because it touches in the next level um, all the other colors. Right. So, so this means that in the bottom layer, the four colors need to be used, and then I just place a final break, and that cannot be any of the four colors, so it has to be. Red. So this is the, this is actually, I cheated a little bit because this is not the coloring that my program gave. So this is a coloring that works well with the proof where you start from the beginning and move down. So this is really uh, what you can what you can sort of get out of these kinds of, of uh, experiments. And I've done this a lot. <laughs> so I've I've been running these programs for a long time in various configurations. Let me just show you what what the program sort of looks like. So this is supposed to be an animation of uh, of running this program. So I'm going to first show you the animation. And then explain you about what happens. So this is really my program running. So these are the two sides playing. Uh, they have a three by one by one, and they want to reach. Play one wants to reach four because I, I proved that four would be enough, and it was unclear if if four was necessary for three. Uh, but here is actually uh, a proof in the sense that here is an example that you can then uh, test. Right, but let me go back in the animation and show you. Uh, works in the very beginning, right? So the program works in the following way. So first I place a bunch of, of uh, boxes that don't touch, and then I color them with color one. I should say, by the way, that, you know, the first thing I did when I started thinking about this, the very first thing, when, as soon as I came up with this problem, I wrote a new program that put things completely randomly and then computed the chromatic numbers which work terribly because the probability of getting something with a high chromatic number is very, very small. So if you just sort of take a random thing and do the graph and compute the chromatic number, you're going to have to wait a very long time before you get to even something like four in a situation like this. So I had to come up with something uh, much better. And this was the game that was invented by these, uh, these students. <clears throat> so the way that I do it more precisely, first I place out these uh, things that don't touch. And then uh, now this is sort of the start of the game. And now player uh, one <coughs> is going to place a brick somewhere where, uh, where she can destroy the coloring that's already changed. That's very easy if there's only one color. You just need it to touch something else. And now player two has to in introduce uh, a new color. 
But then you can sort of see now it gets a little bit more complicated. So player one tries to place uh, a brick somewhere where she can force a third color. So the idea, for instance, is to put some, that's what the program does, it's just random. So I just put something here because it touches a red one and a red one, yellow one. So this uh, forces a uh, new color, we can hope, but actually it does not because if you sort of look at this uh, configuration, there's nothing to prevent me from making this one yellow and this one red. It's, this is what happens. So when I recolor, I get uh, actually this situation. So even though player one tried to force a third color, she was not successful. But then you just keep on doing this, right? So you keep on doing this, and actually at some point, uh, now player two has to allow a third color. And then you keep on doing this even longer. This takes a long time. And <coughs> oops, thank you much. And then eventually, uh, player two has to give up and introduce a fourth color. And then, of course, you can see that this is something you know, this is random, this is made in a very convoluted way. So, what you can do is you can go in and clean up. So, what you say is that if I can remove one of these uh, bricks and the chromatic number still is four, then I throw it away. And this is sort of the last step of the, of the configuration. So, actually, here, I mean, so I made these. Transparent, so you can sort of see I'm throwing away everything but the, this situation down here. And so this one I think has 14 bricks, and I need four colors. And this shows that four is the, also the, the correct number, even if I have three colors on top of that. So, and then you can actually you know do this many times, and you can find something that's more efficient than what I have. But as, as far as I know, uh, I cannot do it with seven bricks like I could for the for the four by one by one and actually i found that the graph that i get from four by one by one i looked it up in the house of graphs it's actually in there and it, it, it's it's an example uh maybe that's not i'm not it's maybe i'm confusing this graph but at some point i found a graph and i could find it and find it in the house of graphs and it was stated that this was minimal with a certain chromatic number and a certain number of places so you sometimes you can actually prove that the solutions that you have on, on the limit. Okay, so this is really what um, the, the first sort of input that I got from, from my students uh, was a way to come up with examples. And this is something that uh, I've been able to use um, various places. So uh, first of all, we can close this. So this is also four for n equals three. Uh, and then actually, uh, next time I gave the course, uh, some other students proved that uh, for the two, two, one, it's exactly five. So they proved that five is the correct um, chromatic number for the two, two, one. And I, I mean, it doesn't really matter if I put chi one or chi two. Chi two will allow me to change the two, two. That doesn't matter. The argument they gave was uh, somewhat surprising. Uh, so uh, what they did, I, I'm sorry, there is a type of here. Uh, this has to be moved one to the left here. Yeah, the, the top and the bottom layer is left when I look at screen. This is wrong, uh, but I mean, so let's let's work over here where it's correct. So this is a this is the way of inheriting uh, a coloring with five colors from a ten by ten by two uh, region. And it's obvious if you just look in one layer that this will work. I mean, so the idea is that I have like a square I put here, then I'm going to make it yellow. But then there's no way I can I can reach this yellow or that yellow. So they will not touch within the um, within the layer. And this is very easy, right? This is this, this you can do for all sizes. It doesn't nothing to do with two by two. And it would give me a five coloring of something which is plainer, which is not very impressive. Uh, but the point is that I can I can do something similar in the next layer, and that will give me something that works everywhere. And the point is that if you sort of look at a place like like here, where you have white and yellow and blue and, and white and yellow and red and black, then you sort of used up all the colors except blue. Right? So this is the color that you choose in your next layer. So if you just do this systematically, you get a layer that looks like this, just translate it around. And then you can prove that you, when you inherit your coloring from this, uh, you get a coloring, so five is in a form two, two, one. 
So this is something that you know I've known for a long time. The correct number for the two by two Lego brick. Um, this so um, this is really um, a very interesting way of working. And us uh, and I try to go back to these things and look at them a little bit more systematically. And actually, we found some things that I didn't uh, already know. So the first thing that is a little bit striking is that if you fix the size of the cuboid, no matter how big it is, you can get by with eight colors if you don't turn it. And the argument is very, very simple. I just take a box, which is eight times as big as my cuboid. So it's two by two times A, like times two by B, two B times two C. And so that is something which is eight times bigger. So you can think of it as something that you divide up in octets. And then you just use different colors in these octets. And so this is a way of, of inheriting <laughs> coloring. Why does this work? Well, it works because if you have two cuboids that have an X coordinate, uh, that have two X coordinates whose difference is exactly A, they will have different colors. And if they have a Y coordinate whose difference is exactly B, they will have different colors. And if they have a Z coordinate whose difference is exactly C, they will have different colors. But if two cuboids meet, then there has to be one side where they're tangential and then two other sides where they sort of overlap. So there has to be one of these three directions where they will be different. So this is why eight colors is there. So this has nothing to do with four color theory and so on. This is really just a, a very sort of elementary way of, of coloring. Uh, and I'm wondering why we didn't think of this earlier, but it somehow came up when the hospital started tried to be a little bit more systematic, we, we could see this. And then we actually found that if you, um, if you do something about the second point, if you fix it to two, then uh, you can get by with six colors, a sort of a systematic uh, six color that you can get. And if the second point is three, you can get by with 21 colors. So uh, the students that I mentioned that came up with this two by two solution, they mainly looked at squares. So they actually also had seven for three, three. But this, as far as I know, is, is not really there. And then we made this, this peculiar observation, which is also very easy. So what I mean by this, now I'm going back to completely general cuboids, but I'm asking that all the dimensions are R. And so all the sides are R length. Then you can get by with eight colors. And it's sort of clear why, because when you just take your, you just color your, your cuboid by the, the lowest corner, and you color it by the parity. Right? So you sort of say, Depending on whether or not it's even or odd in the in the three coordinates, you choose uh, one of eight colors. But now, since all the sides are odd, the the side where they where they touch, the, the they have to have different parity in the in the smallest corner right? because the difference. I mean, if it's seventeen long, then uh, the difference between the where this one starts and this one starts has to be seventeen, which is odd. So they have different parity, so they would have different colors. So this means that you can sort of, uh, now I'm sort of back in the territory of, of uh, read and all right. So this sort of means that if you want to go to infinity, you have to take some odd numbers, some even numbers once in a while. I assume they do that, right? But somehow, um, this, this is a little bit surprising to me that you can do this. I wish I could find something to use it for, but uh, I don't really know how to do how to it. Okay, so now uh, the, uh, chi 2 is where I'm allowing to turn in the x, y um, dimension. And actually, in the very first paper on this, which is from this study group with industry, uh, I found this uh, example. So this is a, a, an 8 by 2 example. It's very easy. So just two layers, so only uh, 12 bricks. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy to see that you cannot color this with 5. And the way that you do it is so they sort of you know, they need a big point. So if you use four colors here, you have to do that. And then you can sort of see if you if you have only five colors, then you're going to have to put it in the fifth color at some point. And then uh, no matter what you do, you do not color. So this is sort of an elementary argument. Uh, I was looking for it uh, today. I couldn't find it uh, in the published version. So I think this is in a preprint version, but uh, I'm pretty sure I have it from you. So this, of course, is a is a Lego solution. Right, so there's a, there, there is an eight two by eight Lego brick that you can buy, 
uh, and this takes you all the way to to the way. And then, uh, actually, uh, these people who invented the game, they also gave me uh, a configuration that needed six colors with the, the most important Lego brick, the four by two. Uh, so this is a very big one. We managed to find a slightly smaller one. Um, so they did this by sort of being player one themselves. They put things in, and then they asked the computer to read color. When I wrote my program and ran for a long time, the, the, the most interesting thing I found was actually you can also find something in six colors with a 611. So this is just a, one of these uh, fries, but you this time, of course, I'm training them. Um, this is the, the, the smallest I know in the country's property. And also, um, actually, if you vary the argument um, of the 2014 XM students, uh, you can you can show that five colors are enough with two one. So this is a little bit more complicated. I'm not going to try to visualize it, but it essentially it's the same as before. It's like it's a 10 by 10 by 2 uh, inherited coloring. Of course, now you have two ways of putting your, your brick, right? Either go this way or that way. You have to choose color depending on the direction. So this is uh, what they found. And um, so this is really, this is all I know uh, about using six colors. So if we have one by one, one by two, two by two, then we can prove that five colors are enough. So I can never find anything that needs six colors. If I have one by six, two by four, two by five, two by six, and so on, I, I know an example where I can get to uh, six and I can sort of keep this moving because essentially it's, you have these counter examples and you can realize them with bigger and bigger bricks, but you need to control the eccentricity. So I have sort of a problem down here where these are square. I cannot build counters. I never, I don't know a counter example with six with a square brick, no matter how big it is. Uh, but also I cannot prove it doesn't exist. So these white uh, zones, these are the things that I'm And actually, <clears throat> if you do the same with five, until recently, this is the situation. So with five, you know, uh, one by one is, of course, you cannot get to four and five, but one by one. And in all the other cases, uh, I could get to five. So I've shown you the solution with two by two, and it's very easy to generalize this to <laughs> two squares. But uh, in order to go with two by three and one by three and so on, you get somewhat different uh, configurations, but it's very easy to find them using uh, my program. I mean, the, the way it works is that I, I, I take a fairly big size uh, brick, maybe one by six, and then I run and see if I can find an example. And then I look for a small example. And as soon as I have a small example, I can sort of do this by hand and then prove in general that for this kind of uh, eccentricity, if it's eccentric enough, then, then I, can, I can make examples. So this, this was somewhat annoying. And actually, I can fill this out. So this is really uh, the new thing that has happened. So this is what Rasmus did. This is um, as a uh, power project. So uh, first of all, so the idea was you know, to try to uh, see if we can do a larger scale compensation. And the big problem uh, in doing these compensations, uh, the way that I've been doing it this far, is that the um, the chromatic number um, uh, procedure that's built into Maple is terribly slow. So uh, Maple mm -hmm. is not very good for a situation like this. So if you sort of do this experiment, and of course, you know, the way it works, you play this game, whenever you play a two, you have to recolor the whole thing. So it takes a very long time. And uh, if your graphs get big enough, so if they have like 100 vertices or something like that, there's no way that Maple will be able to answer this. So uh, Rasmus uh, made the decision of writing a program in Python instead of Maple. That makes it a lot faster just right there. Uh, but then also to use uh, a set solver to, to color. So this is something that you somehow, you, you take your, uh, your coloring program and you could recast it as a satisfiability problem. And then you have, you have standard tools that you can sort of use. And this speeds up things uh, quite a lot. But maybe not enough. So Rafael also came up with a very good idea that sometimes player one will place her bricks based on valency. Right? Because the point really is that you want to have many neighbors. 
So if you if you want to do what I just told you to do is that you sort of put a brick somewhere where it touches a lot of colors, this presupposes that you already colored what's left, right? So you have to have a coloring before this makes sense. But you can also much faster, you can say, okay, can I put a brick somewhere where it has many layers? And then there's sort of various things you can you can do, and it depends a little bit on the situation, what works best. So you can sort of imagine that sometimes you just place your brick with many neighbors. This works pretty well. Uh, sometimes you have to maybe place your brick uh, based on coloring once in a while, maybe 10% or something like that is enough. So you can save a lot of time in practice. And then uh, as just the program sort of did two things. Uh, it looked for configurations that needed many colors, but it also looked for inherited coloring because, of course, it, the existence of an inherited coloring is itself a coloring problem. Because you sort of say, if you look at all the configurations that you, know, you sort of have to make a, a qualified guess of the size of the region. And so I'm sort of guessing, okay, maybe my brick is two by three by one. Maybe it's going to work with a 12 by 12 by two region, something like that. Then I can say, so I will just make a graph that that uh, finds all these positions that my my uh, brick can be put in in this sort of periodic coloring, and this gives me a big graph, and I connect it with if the, if the objects touch, and then I just need, just need the chromatic number for this. So these graphs, of course, they get fairly big, uh, and uh, they turn out to be fairly nasty to to uh, run. So so the way uh, it's it's sort of a bit of a mystery how these uh, SAT solvers work, at least uh, for me. But the way it works in practice is that sometimes you give it uh, a graph which looks pretty big, and then very quickly it comes up with the answer. And sometimes you give it a graph that doesn't look so bad, and then uh, you never get that. So um, this is really the, the run times are very, very difficult to predict. And sometimes, you know, we could just let it run for a day and nothing happens and we have no idea is it close or are we still waiting or should we give up uh, so we did some experiments that were sort of parallelized which actually the idea was just to say okay let's try a lot of things uh, i just did this on this computer which has eight cpus right so i sort of said instead of of uh of sitting and waiting for the program to finish i would start eight of them and then you know once in a while i would get you back from one of them and then i could release somehow this works pretty well so uh so doing this uh we came up with the following thing and this is somehow i think the most interesting thing that happened in this uh, business for a very long time this is a uh, uh, configuration with two by ones by ones that need five colors and uh, this is the smallest one we know. It has 162. Uh, 26. 122 yeah. uh, bricks. Um, it is uh, minimal in the sense that, I mean, this needs five colors. I haven't colored it, by the way. And this is not, I, I mean, Asmus gave me the coordinates, but I forgot to ask for the <laughs> color. And there's no way maybe we could color something like this, but actually, I have here in my pocket the. Uh, oh, yeah. I don't know. Okay, I used to have in my pocket the. Uh, sorry about this. Uh, the the built version. So they asked me if I if I get this stuff from Lego, and the answer is no. But they sometimes send me um, bricks that I can use to give talks. So we use them. I'm um, sorry, you're gonna have to change that. <laughs> so the the point is that this one had one black uh, uh, brick, and the point is that this is this is uh, this is critical, right? In the sense that if you remove any one of these bricks, four colors are enough. Right, so in the practice, it means that you can say, okay, I want this one to be black, and then there's four colors that will, that will suffice for the rest. It's very difficult for us to, to check this by hand. We have no really, we cannot really explain this phenomenon to be uh, absolutely certain that this was correct. We, we use a different solver, uh, more like an integer programmer thing to, to check this. So we're certain that it needs five colors. But of course, there's something really weird going on here that somehow this is something that we don't know how to explain. We don't know how to explain that it has to be, I mean, it seems to be the case that it has to be in the space. So, you know, certainly, you know, before uh, Asmus is much more efficient program, I've tried this on my Maple program many, many hours, not finding anything, but I've never looked at something entirely this way. So, so 
This, of course, is the, the weakness of uh, experimental methods. Somehow, sometimes you find a solution and you can't really explain it or, or sort of understand it, uh, but at least we know that it exists. So, I mean, here's a, here's a transparent version. I don't know what that is. <laughs> so, but I mean, it's a it's very hard pact. And uh, this is something, I mean, this is not the only example of this nature. We have more, this is just a small one, but uh, it's a little bit hard for us to sort of understand what, what goes on. So, this is really, uh, I'm sort of reaching the end of my talk here. Um, so, this is really uh, what I know about. Two, right? So for um, chi two two one one, this is five, and five is strictly less than six, and six is a lower bound for this thing. But I don't know this thing. Right? I don't know if there exists a and b that will take me to seven or eight colors. So this is just left me equal to a, but I don't know uh, which number it is, and. I would be willing to put some money on six uh, without really having a very strong sort of mathematical uh, reason for it. But I, I, I think this is somewhat likely that actually this should not go all the way up to eight. But I have no idea how to prove it because, of course, I don't really know what the, what the, what the graphs that I will encounter in a situation like this, but they, what they look like. So let me just say uh, the very few things I know about the general, the, the sort of three dimensional problem where you're allowing uh, all six directions. So I can, I can use my better estimate of uh, chi one. So Fischl's uh, estimate was 15 because he used the valency. So you can always use a valency argument, but these are not efficient. They usually can do better. And here we get down from 15 to eight. So then I have to multiply it by six. So this is 48. So um, this number is bounded by 48. I have never seen it above six. And you know, the ones I already showed you some examples with six. And there I didn't even have to take the objects and put them upside down. Right? So these were just uh, these were just uh, layers. But actually, uh, Nicholas Schuler, who uh, was one of the people in the uh, group that found this uh, estimate to five. He actually found some years later that uh, six colors were enough for the two one. So he found a, an ingenious coloring of a 12 by 12 by 12 region by thinking uh, that was, was using six colors. And actually, Rathus and I managed to find it again using uh, four. So it's, it's, uh, we, we confirmed this. Uh, so this is sort of, I don't know any other uh, result of the nature, but this tells me that this number is a lot bigger than six. But that doesn't really help, right? So, so I'm still sort of with my takeaway here. Uh, I don't know two one one for the dimer. I don't know if it's five or six, and I don't know if this number is um, is six or not. It's a number I can tell you it's between six and forty eight, but that's what I can do. Right? So this is somehow not super aggressive, but at least forty eight is strictly less than eight. So this is what we have, and then uh, maybe some. Other, I mean, so there's some implicit questions in what I've already told you, but these are some more things that you could ask, right? So, for instance, okay, can we get above six if we allow things to be moved around completely freely? I would say definitely so. I mean, it seems unreasonable that six could bound this. Uh, is it possible that, uh, sorry, I, this is supposed to be tied to, so if we just have, I, I mean, otherwise, we may, otherwise. Oh, no, okay. Well, I think I guess I can say the second. I don't know that, but I was second to two. And then uh, this maybe it's the most embarrassing problem. Uh, can we find any A, B, C so that there's a gap between what happens if you're allowing just the two uh, first to be uh, uh, transposed, or if you take all all uh, combinations here, and also what happens if you just work with the groups. This is also, I mean, I can bound this by eight because uh, I can bound any chi eight, chi one by eight. Uh, it should be possible to do something better than two, but I don't know. So that's it. Uh, okay, are there any questions in here or in online part of the audience? 
I was wondering with the Lego structures, can you have bricks that are sort of not together with the rest through the knobs? So, I mean, this is, uh, so when I, when I count, this is a very reasonable question, but when I count, I only count the sort of contiguous buildings where everything is built together. So this means in practice, if you sort of lift one brick, the whole structure comes along. And, and actually, before I destroyed Rasmus's model, this was one of these uh, uh, kind of models. But I don't put it in as a, as a requirement. And it's not really necessary because you can, unless you have a, a one by one by one, you could always sort of build something that will, you can put on below it so that you sort of build it together with some extra bricks. So the chromatic number for contiguous buildings is the same as the chromatic number for all buildings. So, but it's, it's it's sort of relevant because I have these sort of counts for for the particular buildings, and I've been thinking about trying to sort of go through them and, and make make some sort of analysis. But I haven't reached this yet. Of course, there are many. That's the <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, yeah, so I was wondering. You have this uh, cleanup procedure to run after yes. this run the game. Yes. Uh, but then I was wondering. If you've maybe thought about like running the team procedure in between rounds, because then you get a smaller graph and then it's maybe faster yeah. to, to do the coloring. Did you have this? No, I haven't, but you, usually you actually, it's not really true when you said that. Um, and I usually just did this decision by valency. I entirely did it. So I put maybe like 400 bricks and then mm. I would. Uh, see how many colors I needed, and then yeah, the, so so yeah. so these examples they were done by valency alone. Yeah, only with things. We have um, we have a question from <coughs> online uh, audience. Uh, do you know anything about the computational complexity of determining the chromatic number of these graphs? Uh, <clears throat> so that it somehow should be easier if you have a graph that's represented like this. Um, Yes, the answer is no, I don't know any. Um, I guess, I mean, it sort of touches on the, the sort of big problem, right, that I, I'm trying to sort of answer here is what's special about graphs that can be represented in this way. As far as I know, this is not something that people have looked at very much. But of course, it could very well happen that there's something about these graphs that are, that make them easier to color. Like with an inherited color in the that's very easy. Um, so I, I, I think this is a very natural thing to look for, but I've never been able to do anything like that. Okay. There are no questions here. Um, if there are no questions in the online part of the audience, let's speak. Let's thank the speaker again. Oh, no, we, oh, I don't know. Um, all right, so um, I guess uh, we see each other next time. Uh, next week, uh, it's going to be an online talk by Leonid Modin. Um, those that are in the mailing list uh, will get the announcement and please log in with using this link next time. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Uh,